Hello everyone and welcome to episode 12 of Everyday Eternal. I'm Sam Craven and I'm joined by Matt Pavlik and Jacob Corey. Today we're going to have a little bit longer episode than normal. We're going to blame that on trying to give you a little bit more entertainment for your drive or your flight to Star City Los Angeles Eternal Weekend or Bazaar of Mox in Paris. We're going to have a little bit of a preview for what we might expect for those tournaments. Uh, before we go into that though, we're going to have a preview of some of the bigger commander cards that we're looking to see uh, make a splash at these events. But first, let's rewind just a little bit into a subject that Kobe missed last time we recorded. Last time we recorded, we talked about favorite Johnny decks. Um, you weren't here, though, so we'd like to know what's your favorite Johnny deck and how many Grizzlebrands does it play? Oh, gosh. I, I guess I'm, uh, I've been typecasted to be a Grizzlebrand player. But, um, yeah, it's true. Grizzlebrand is one of my more favorite cards at this time. Um, is it the Drawing 7 that you like so much, or is it the Lifelink? You know, to be honest, I, I think it's really that uh, I recognize it as a very powerful card. And I don't think it belongs in Legacy still. So I've been doing my effort to try to get the card banned in Legacy. By winning uh, with it as much as possible. That's right. <laughs> if I can, I, I mean, I think that was initially the. When I first saw it, like back in May of last year, I'm like, wow, this card's insane. So right away I built the uh, Sneak Show deck, I think, which hasn't really morphed too much except for a few counter spells here and there. But, uh,. It, it was just insane, like being able to draw that many cards, being able to draw that many counter spells, let's say in all the blue combo decks, um, being able to beat Rug on turn one just by reanimating it and attacking for three turns, they, they can't really deal with it. Um, you know, it, it causes a lot of fear in people when uh, when you're able to get a quick Grizzle Brand out, and uh, it, it's very hard to deal with. Even if you, Kara let's say you cap the classic way to counter it, which is Caracas. Well, your opponent still gets to draw 7 to 14 cards. And uh, I can actually relate a, uh, a story from last night's f and I was playing Modern, a, um, essentially a modern version of a Grizzlebrand deck, with uh, Necrotic Ooze and Barbarigamos. Uh, essentially, draw a bunch of cards and discard a bunch of lands to uh, deal direct damage to your opponent. Well, my opponent's on Splinter Twin, and he... And I, I had the situation with my opponent's on Splinter Twin. He's about ready to cast Splinter Twin on a, a Pestermite. And I've got one mana up, signifying that I potentially have a Lightning Axe. Which, um, for those who don't know, it's a uh, Time Spiral Common. Uh, red Instant costs single red mana. As an additional cost, you discard a card or pay additional 5 mana. And the effect is deal 5 damage to target creature. So effectively it's a, like a 1 mana discard and removal. Uh, discard spell for yourself and removal. So, my opponent um, recognized that I could potentially have a lightning axe, so he needs to find an extra counter spell. But he didn't have the mana to both counter and play the Splinter Twin, so effectively he's going to be dead. Um, he's going to be dead because at the end of my turn, I reanimated Grizzlebrand with Gorio's Vengeance. Um, instant speed reanimation. Um, also used in Tin Fins and the Gorios deck uh, in Modern. This is a different variation of it. And effectively, he couldn't play his combo, but one thing that he failed to recognize was that if he didn't cast his combo, I was going to draw another 7 cards to go up to like 17 cards up in my hand. And That's that whole card advantage thing coming yeah, into play. He, yeah, he had 3 cards and you knew one of them had to be a combo piece. Um, so effectively, he was going to pass the turn, and I'm going to untap with 17 cards, and he had and to And if you it. don't win with 17 cards, you need to go home. I would even extend that, you know, like even the Omnitel decks um, effectively use that same idea, use casting Entry of the Infinite, drawing their entire deck, and at that point, it's almost academic winning the game. If you can't win the game with all your deck in your hand, something's gone horribly, horribly wrong. We actually discussed this a little bit in the... Uh combo episode we said that uh in against some of these show and tell decks or the reanimate decks you kind of have to attack the way that they're getting grizzlebrand into play because once grizzlebrand is in play whatever you do isn't really going to matter that much because they're going to draw seven or 14 cards in response to whatever you do yeah especially in a blue deck that has access to force of will that that's very scary i mean a lot of times the only the only real way to 
be able to try to beat it is to just face check them. Essentially, force them to have the force of will. And if they don't, then you can maybe resolve a spell. If they do, well, at least you tried, because you're just going to die when they untap anyway. Um, so I think with, with the Grizzlebrand kind of scenario in both Modern and Legacy, not so much Vintage. Vintage is a little bit of a, a special egg. It's got way too much things going on there, so... Um, but in both Modern and Legacy, that's that's been my modus operandi. Just really trying to get the card banned. It's not... I don't think it's an appropriate card for those formats. I don't think there's enough tools in those formats to um, to really address Grizzlebrand and the power level that he brings to the table. And so that quest for me started in the middle of last year to um, to really try to get the most broken version of a Grizzlebrand deck out. So, and that's when I also put up the uh, the Maverick hat off to the side, recognizing that Grizzlebrand is a little bit more powerful just a little bit Th more. Than a bunch of bears? Than a bunch of bears with uh, some utility ab abilities. Um, but really it was, uh, I think, Greg uh, Mitchell out in uh, Atlanta last March. Um, he had a deck tech featuring like, tin fins, which um, for those uninitiated, tin fins is essentially a joke name for... Um, the Grizzlebrand Instant Speed Reanimator Storm Deck, um, very much modeled, uh, very closely modeled to an ad nauseum tendrils deck. Um, it's kind of like a hybrid ad nauseum tendrils and classic reanimator kind of mushed together. And uh, the two cards that are really important in, in that deck that really make the combo work are Shallow Grave and Goryeo's Vengeance, which effectively do the same thing. They return a creature from your graveyard into play with haste. And I think the haste portion of both those spells is, is the most important part because you're able to attack with the Grizzlebrand right away, deal 7 damage, and gain an extra 7 life, which means you get to draw an extra 7 cards. So both those spells effectively allow you to draw between 14 to 21 cards on your turn. And going back to what Sam said, if you have that many cards in your hand and you can't find a way to win, I mean, you should probably put the deck away. Probably should quit playing Magic. It's, I mean, it's ludicrously easy to to be able to win games with that many cards in your hand. All right, Kobe, thank you for that. Uh, Matt, you recently played in Star City, Seattle. Did uh, pretty well. You want to talk to us about that? <clears throat> All right, guys. So as you may know, a couple weekends ago from this recording, and from probably when you're listening, it was Star City Games Seattle, which I attended. So. I posted my list on MGG The Source, but I'll just, I guess, go through it now as well. So I was playing Junk, as I usually do at most major tournaments, because it's, it's the deck I know best. And as we've said before many times, this is probably the key decision in your deck choice. Not what's good in the format, not whatever, what you know the best. So I was playing Death Rite Shamans, Dark Confidants, Night of the Reliquary, Tarmogoyf, Scavenging Ooze, Luxidon Smiter, Thoughtseize, Cabal Therapy, Green Sun Zenith, Three Sylvan Libraries, Liliana Veil, vale, Swords, Plowshares, Abrupt Decay, and then obviously the lands to help fill this out. My board, Lingering Souls, Pithing Needle, Golgari Charm, Thalia, Gadoteague, Pernicious Deed, Garrick Relentless, and Sylvan Safekeeper. Now, I think there was a quote that I used that a friend of mine had said who was also playing Junk that day, and the quote is this, If I ever suggest to cut Golgari Charm from the board of this deck in this current meta, punch me in the face. Cause that card is yeah. That card's really solid against so much of the format. Oh, it right was now. so great all day. I'm I'm so glad I had that card in my in my sideboard. Oh, all right. So I went six three. I feel like in spirit I went seven two, just due to some really really super bad luck. Anyway, I'll talk about that after. But the record was good. I moneyed. That's fine. So round one, I played a guy named Bennett with Werewolf Stacks. So he was running some crazy, like, Chalice of the Void, Ancient Tomb, Trinisphere, Blood Moon. Werewolf Stompy, a major problem in the meta right now. I know, now. It's, it is quite rampant. But uh, I'd never seen, like, Rockamar. He was playing Rockamar and and the Innistrad werewolves that flip if you don't play spells or whatever. It, Matt, were you a card reader in this game? I was game? definitely a reader. 
pretty much every single guy he played, I was like, what the fuck are you playing? I don't even know. <laughs> it didn't matter, though, because I won the die roll, and I just had, like, Sylvan Library, and he tried to cast a Blood Moon off of a Cavern of Souls, an Ancient Tomb, which obviously isn't a thing. So I'm like, oh, I'll just fetch all my basics now. And then I just blew him out with, like, Sylvan Library, Knights, Loxton, Smiter. Um, also, too, Abrupt Decay going through a Chalice at 2 was pretty important. So, of course, he couldn't believe his eyes, so, yeah, I, I fucked him up. Then game two, I bring in, like, Thalia, Teague, Pernish's the Golgari Charm, and just make it even worse. I trap him under a his own Trinisphere through a Wasteland Lock with Thalia and Gaddic Teague, and then his only answer is apparently Bonfire the Damned to clear the board, and, oh, whoops, Gaddic Teague. So, suffice to say, I won that. 2-0. So you don't think Werewolf Stacks is going to be uh, be prevalent? We're not going to be hearing about a lot of that out of the Invitational? Oh, I definitely think not. <laughs> so then, round two, I played Death and Taxes, which is a gentleman named Andrew, and I've seen him before in the Seattle area. He's, he's looked to be a good guy before, and it turns out he was actually a very good guy this time. Um, first game, I obviously have the read. He's on Death and Taxes. Somebody plays planes in this fucking format. It's a pretty good giveaway. Uh, we go back and forth a little bit. I get double sorts of plowshares off Lux and Spider and Goyf. He comes back with Avon Mindsetter and Thalia with a GTA with like eight counters on it. GTA goes nuts. I lose everything and die. No big deal. I bring Deeds, Golgari Charm, Pithing Needle, Garrick, Lingering Souls. I plan to fuck up his shit. Uh, I board out my Knights and my Goyf because I know if he brings in a rest at peace, I'm just boned. So, the problem is... Um, they also have Mirren Crusader. Mirren Crusader is pretty good. However, I get turned to Sylvan Library and just bury the fuck out of him. Uh, I go garage harm him. I deed him. He gets um, he gets Mirren Crusader online, but of course I have Swords of Plowshares. Uh, Luxon and Smiter is pretty good. I needle Gta like he, he's not in this. Uh, round two, game three was interesting though because he'd actually forgotten his Jeep counters once, and I didn't even notice it. We were in the heat of battle. And then later on, he says, oh, crap, I missed my GT counters. And, of course, with all these, like, changes in, like, the do you get counters, do you not, I was pretty sure he didn't get the counters. But he was really pissed off, and it was... I, I felt really bad for him, because it probably could have won in the game. Then, interesting thing. He has a Stoneforge Mystic in play. End of turn, he casts Flicker Wisp. Flicker Wisp bouncing his Stoneforge Mystic. Stoneforge Mystic comes back into play. He searches for Batter Skull. So what's happening is, while he's searching for Batter Skull, he says he's searching for Batter Skull. We, we've shortcut it a few times in the Stoneforge Mystic searches throughout the uh, throughout the round. So I go, okay, well, based on the information that I have, saying you're getting my bat- getting the Batter Skull, end of turn, all sorts of plowshares, your Stoneforge Mystic, it resolves. However, about thirty seconds later, he's like, oh fuck, there's no Batter Skull in my deck. And then he checks his sideboard, and he's like, fuck, I boarded it out. <laughs> So then we kind of have to go, well, what's happening here? I only source the plowshares here if you have this, if, you know, if there's actually a battery. If this skull. shortcut is accurate. Yeah. I'm basing my shortcut based on this information and nothing else. So he goes, well, can we turn this back? And I said, I don't know. We, we both, it, it turns out we actually both wanted to be able to turn it back. Not just me, or not just him. We both thought that it was pretty prudent to kind of say, hey, let's back this up and let's do this the right way. But we're not sure if we can do that on our own. So we call the judge, of course, because when you don't know something, you call the judge. And he's like, so both of you guys want to rewind? Yes. Okay, usually you don't have both people wanting to rewind, he said. But apparently if you both agree on it and it's okay, then you can do it without calling a judge. That's what this judge told us. Now... Another judge has since told me that you should still call a judge anyway to make sure. What do you think, Sam? Can you? I think that sounds like uh, it's always safest to call a judge because the worst thing that happens is that you will get exactly what you want. Yeah. In that situation, but you don't want to, you don't want to rewind. And the really the 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 reason you want to call a judge is if you rewind and then something doesn't go your opponent's way, and they call the judge and say, hey, well, he rewound this improperly. Yeah. Okay. So then we were we were okay. So be kind when you rewind. tee Okay. So round three was Tim with goblins. I got fucking destroyed. 
Um, <laughs> Krenko, uh, Warchief, Lackey, Matron, Siege Gang, like, Chieftain, like, I just got fucked up. Um, game two, it, I, like, I had a decent hand. I still have to, in this matchup, I still have to keep in um, Knight and Goyf, just because, like, they're my big beaters. They're my abysses. Uh, but it turns out he starts off with double Relic of Progenitus into my, like, decent Tarmogoyf hand. And then he gets Krenko again and just rolls over me. So, unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Um, I played another guy called Matt, named Matt, with Merfolk. Uh, I 2 would him. He's shuffling, and he's pretty pretty loose with the shuffling. And he turns his deck over, and there's like, oops, there's a Merfolk, whatever, Sovereign, or Regeree, or whatever. So I figured he was on Merfolk, Professor Matt Padlet <coughs> says. That's, that's some uh, good deductive reasoning there, Matt. That's what I figured. He was either on some sort of crazy Merfolk stacks, uh, you know, from my experience in round one. Saw some werewolves, werewolf stacks. Or he was on Merfolk. Um, well, you know... Maybe he's uh, gearing up for the true name nemesis. That is true. He probably <laughs> will be adding that card. He seems like a good guy. He plays modern a lot, he said. He was really tight with the deck. I assumed when we were playing, though, because he was very tight and everything with his play that he'd been playing this deck for a while. Nope. Just a good player who had come into Legacy. So that was actually quite exciting to see. Had me completely fooled. Except he didn't have me fooled in the game because I just absolutely slaughtered him because Abrupt Decay is so fucking good against that deck. I don't. I, I can see why... People don't play it now, or as much. Holy crap. Swords of Plowshares for that deck. Uh, Uproot Decay. Um, Luxidon Spider being bigger than anything until they get a couple lords online. Um, yeah, it was great. They can't island walk past me. It was wonderful. I love this matchup. I play around Submerge all day in game two, so I never crack my fetches uh, when I have big creatures on board, and I just fucking get there. Uh, played against Omnitel next. Omnitel is the general, you probably lose round one because, well, it's round one against Omnitel. Uh, game two, I absolutely obliterate him. Uh, game three, he starts with Leland of Sanctity, but I'm not on a discard hand, assuming he keeps aligned with, Le with Leland of Sanctity. I have Thalion Gedictig, um, and then I just brick and I draw lands for about five turns, which happens, I get it. Um, but then... He's sitting there putting lands... Like, he was a little bit tight on lands, too, uh, because of Thalia. He eventually gets enough lands to show and tell. So with four mana, he show and tell, puts omniscience in. Uh, of course, I brick and don't draw anything, and then he untaps with a double cunning wish hand to bounce both Gaddictig and Thalia. And Ouch. then go off. And I'm Ouch. like, yeah, like, what are the chances? I mean, that's what, that was very heartbreaking just because of the fact that on my Sylvan activation next turn... I hit Cabal Therapy Golgari Charm blank, which is obviously I Golgar. All right, I name I Cabal Therapy naming Cunning Wish because that's the only card that wins in the game. And of course he has double dubs. Like it happens. I get it. Uh, better lucky than good, but it was pretty heartbreaking because I was X one at that point. Um, I could have top aided if I hadn't lost him, which is okay. I'm okay with that. I'm at peace with it now. But then I was pretty fucking pissed. Well, when you're in the heat of a tournament, you, you're you always going for first place. You always want to win the tournament. Exactly. That's the reason you're there. I wanted to bring I wanted to bring back-to-back uh, -back November Seattle's home, right? Like, I mean, obviously I didn't bring it home the first time. Bringing it home the second time, <laughs> be, I feel like, you know, <laughs> you know, even top eighting is bringing it home for me. Like, that's fine. It's more money for beta duels. That's all that matters. That's right. The uh, important stuff. Exactly. The important stuff in life. By the way, congratulations on real life. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll touch up on that later in the cast. Yes, I know. Okay, so then in round six, I played against Goblin Settler from the Source, uh, which is also named Matt. It's I think it's a good a good good name, a good vintage. Uh, so he's on mono red goblins, and I again. Yeah, of course I play goblins twice. Um, I lose my note page from this matchup, so I I'm not super familiar in what happened. I'm pretty sure game one, I won two zero. I know that. Game one, I had the everything, I'm pretty sure. And then in game two, he mulled to five, which was pretty sad. So I think in game two, I like Garrick Relentless and then Lingering Souls. And then just roll over him. And it was kind of kind of shitty. But I was 4-2, so I was okay. Uh, we talked about Korean cards, which was amazing. So 
nothing wrong with talking about uh, Korean wastelands and wonderful yeah, pieces of pimp. Big, big fan. I'll, we'll also talk about that later in the cast. I'm so <laughs> excited about the rest of this cast. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, round seven was actually probably one of the best rounds of Magic I've ever played. Um, I would say. Uh, so I pl- got to play against Joel Set playing uh, Blue White Red Miracles. Uh, I won two one. So I will describe this match in more detail, just because of the fact that it was fucking amazing. Um, game one, I keep a hand of double discard, uh, Sylvan Library, and pressure, and enough lands. Uh, I think Joe has to mulligan once. He thinks I'm on bug, because the last time we played, I played bug, and I lost horribly. So, I absolutely destroyed Joe in this game. It wasn't close. He just gets really bad draws. He has a counterbalance going, but then I just get Liliana. He His blind flips never happen. It's bad. Game two, I board out all of my hand disruption, all of my swords of plowshares, all of my goifs and knights. Because the problem is, this deck plays rest in peace, and once he plays rest in peace, it doesn't matter if I kill rest in peace at any point. It's still cleared the graveyard. So I'm not I'm not going to take that chance to have a bunch of zero ones that do nothing. I mean, that's pretty much your entire deck, or your entire sideboard. What did you board in? Oh, God. I boarded in Garruk Relentless, Lingering Souls, Pernicious Deed, Pinning Needle, Thalia, Gaddic T, Golgari Charms. It was about a 13-card sideboard. The matchup is pretty favored. Now, again, okay, sorry, it's favored against most players that aren't Joe set. Because, you know, obviously Joe is, I would say, probably one of the best Miracle players that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, against other uh, more... Um, more juvenile or whatever you want to say, players of the Miracles deck, most people can't get it. I mean, there's a mir- local Miracles player that I play against probably every week, every two weeks, and I don't think I've ever dropped a match to him. There's just too much stuff for him to handle. So basically in game two, I set up Garrick and Liliana, and uh, the problem is he has Venser, and he's doing Venser tricks. So I needle top, Jace comes down, I don't find Teague in time, so then I play Teague after, and then we're bouncing Teague back and forth, and he has a Caracas, and I don't have a Wasteland, and we're trying to... Anyway, what ends up happening is what breaks open the game is he Vendillion cliques me with one card in hand, I have Abrupt Decay, I Abrupt Decay the Vendillion clique, oh, however, his last card in hand, hard cast, Misdirection. Misdirections, my Abrupt Decay to my Liliana, attacks my Garrick Relentless, and then he just turns the game around, because he has Jace on board as well. Uh... That match took about 35 minutes. It was really super tight. It just so happened that he had the one of misdirection, then, hey, that's them's the breaks. Game three, I land Sylvan Library. I draw two extra cards. I run out Gaddic Teague. He gets the Caracas. We bounce back and forth. He gets Jace. I get Garuk again. I start making two twos. He terminuses. Um, there's Pithing Needle. There's Jace. There's Deed. He entreats, I do the board, I come back. Anyway, what ends up happening is we're in turn five of turns. I've got lethal pressure the turn after, I guess my turn seven. Uh, Like a gentleman, Joe concedes because he knows that he can't win this game. And I I had to say that, uh, you know, thank you so very much to Joe for doing that. I mean, I I know he knew we were already out of contention, but I didn't. I thought I still had maybe a chance this weekend in. Uh, and he did end up conceding when he didn't have to. So I'd like to say thanks to Joe for being a gentleman. I think more people should actually concede and not be a total douche. That, you know, if I actually have it, unless for some reason the draw is worth more, at that point in the tournament it was much better to have a win or a loss. So it was very cool beans. Round 8, I played a guy named Nate with Reanimator. Um... I thought he was on Shardless Bug. He played Underground Sea. Anyway, it didn't really matter. I had a hand. I kept a hand of like Caracas Bayou, um, Forest, Scavenging Ooze, Hand Disruption, Sylvan Library. So I kept a hand that was actually turned out to be good against both. Um, I fucked him up with Scavenging Ooze, and he complained that people play main deck Grave Hate in Seattle. Nothing I can do. In Legacy. In Legacy. Scavenging Ooze. Like. Anyway, he was a little bit butthurt. Um, I board in, like, Pithing Needles and Thalias to slow him down. Uh, he gets me on in game two on his turn one with, I repeat, Entomb for Sire of Insanity, which was definitely a reader, but it was in Russian. 
So I actually felt good being on the other side of the, what the fuck does this card do? Oh wait, it's not English. So Sire of Insanity, Lotus Petal, Reanimate. What the fuck is Sire of Insanity? So let's, let's Sam do Yeah, that, reading. that was the sound of me uh, searching for it. Sam, wait, in Sire Legacy? of Insanity. In Legacy. Is, what? Yeah. It's a uh, four black red uh, creature demon at the beginning of your of each end step. Each player discards his or her hand, and it's a six four. Okay, so now this seems like a pile of shit, like a real steaming pile of garbage. Um, it's not. In the reanimator deck, it's better than um. It's better than uh oh what is Jinga Taxes. The problem with yeah, it seems sick in the reanimator match. They just drop that and then put their entire deck into their graveyard. Yeah, it's n- so not just that. Not are they only just putting their deck into their graveyard. Um, the the amount of time that you have for interaction is actually very minimal. Uh, I mean, against Jenga Taxes, you actually get to untap, draw, and play a sorcery if you need to. Like you could innocent blood away at Jenga Taxes if you had to. Uh, I mean, you maybe a Liliana if you get lucky on the top deck. Exactly, or Liliana. Whereas Sire of Insanity, like, he reanimates it, ends his turn, you both discard, so it's like, hopefully you have Swords of Love shares. And of course, Reanimator plays Counterspells, so... Well, but each player discards their hand. Well, that's the point. During each upkeep. I mean, during each end step. And that's fine. Once uh, The thing is, though, on the turn one, I'm never hitting anything again. Yeah. Well, personally, I'd rather uh, get Nickel Bolas reanimated with Shallow Grave and attack that player. Oof. Okay. Well, that's also... That's, that's like classic 1996 beats. I used to do that in my Survival of the Fittest deck. That's... Yeah. I, it's fun. It's fun. I would say both are good. Anyway, getting to, I was pretty what the fuck about this game. But you know what? He, he got me with a card that I've never seen before. I'll give him that. Game three, we tear each other apart with Thought Seizes, and then we both have nothing, but... Then he plays Double Pithing Needle on Karakas and Deathrite Shaman. I have Sylvan, and I find Scavenging Ooze. Oops. Like a boss. Yeah, and I mean, I keep him under a double wasteland, and he doesn't draw any lands, so it doesn't matter. Cool, so I'm 6-2 at this point. I figure if I go 7-2, I can maybe squeak, um, you know, maybe squeak 8th place of top 8, depending on how it went down. I didn't know. Or I could top 16, or at least top 32. Uh, we didn't know, Steve and I, or my run-down opponent who ended up getting 16th place, didn't know if we would both make top 32 if we drew, so we decided to play. Um, I actually knew that Steven was on Miracles, just because of the fact that he was sitting beside my match with Joe, so I knew it was up. As it turns out, though, I totally brick in both of these games, because I don't draw lands, and I don't draw pressure. Um... So in game one, I keep a decent hand, but then draw no pressure. And in game two, I keep a two-lander, and then never draw anything. Like, literally, legitimately, I don't draw anything. It was quite awful. Um, I feel pretty bad, because considering the top eight was like Patriot Delver and Rug Delver, which I feel I would have done really well against. Oh well. Them's the breaks. I get 50 bucks. And people got to find out that they got their shit fucked up with Luxon and Smiter. Yeah, <laughs> card's really solid. Jeez, that card did so much work. I mean, in the combo matchups, he's awful. Obviously, he's a three mana do nothing. Fine. In the fair matchups, people were like, "Can I counterspell him? Can I sword to plowshares him? Can I abrupt decay him?" Like they were, they were just like, "I've never, I don't even know what to do against this card." It's like it does everything. It is like it does everything. Considering that the format... I, I initially added this card just because of the fact that in the in the BGX mirrors, a lot of people are playing Liliana or Him to Torok. I didn't get to get anybody off the Him to Torok and surprise them, because uh, I didn't play any Jund or any Bug. But also, too, against Liliana. Liliana plus one. Put in a 4-4. Four, four. Oh. That has happened. Turn games around like that. So Yeah, I think I think that's... And I know you and I discussed it, Matt. Yeah. Um going into this tournament, and we're both kind of in the opinion that, wow, we really need something against the Jun decks, um, because they're so removal heavy, and really it's Liliana that's the big issue, um, keeping a creature on board for a minus two. So you may get a big creature out, but Punishing Fire just does complete work on all your small cr- all your small creatures. Exactly. And Lockstone Smiter is one of those that, um, as Liliana's kind of ramping up or recharging the minus two, you can just Bam! Gank someone, right as they uh, are least expecting it. 
Exactly, and if they are going to Punishing Fire that sucker, they're going to take up an entire turn to do so. So I think you're okay with that. Also, too, against the matchups with Rest in Peace, sometimes your your bigger hitters, like, say, Tarmogoyf or Knight of the Relic Ray or whatever, are just totally shut down by Rest in Peace. Having a 4-4 that isn't affected by Rest in Peace and also can't be countered in the tempo matchups, where a 4-4 is blocks a Nimble Mongoose, uh, is technically bigger than a Tarmogoyf in, I'd say, the first, you know, fifth of the game. It's it's pretty good. Um, and that was my that was my experience. I got to see uh, Cedric Phillips in a Chipotle's uh, twenty miles away from the event site, just randomly. Got to say hi. That was. Did you get him to sign your burrito? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we were surprised he wasn't at the event, but uh, apparently people have work or something, you know. Hey, so real quick, I just want to point out on Sire of Insanity. The uh, top-rated comment of all time on Gatherer about him is that, quote, removal dies to him. Lol. I approve. So congratulations on your, uh, on your decent run. Um, oh, thank you. We were hoping you would get top eight so we could... Uh, Talk about it. Plug the yeah. podcast. Yeah, so was I, to be honest. Um, fortunately, actually this weekend and currently right now... Um, the Star City Invitational was going on. I think we saw a little bit of Standard, a little bit of Legacy, and uh, yesterday, uh, someone actually pointed out on Twitter, uh, one of the uh, big grinders, Michael Hetrick. Hey, it's like playing a Legacy daily event, then followed by a Standard daily event, and then you do it again two more times the next day. Um, and for those who, uh, I'm referring, of course, to Magic Online daily event. It's essentially four round um, capped event, so no matter how many people join, it's always going to be four rounds. But I think it talks about the amount of skill um, as a Magic player that is required going into this tournament. You're essentially playing two small tournaments back-to-back. -back. Doesn't matter what your record is, you continue playing. And then, if you have a winning record, um, I think even 4-4 may make day two, but I'm not quite sure. Um, essentially, if you have a winning yeah. record. So if you have at least five, and five wins and three losses, you can qualify for day two. Um, and then from there, it's the same thing. And then pretty much day two, I remember, if I remember my LA experience from last December, is to try to maximize the amount of prize winnings you get through careful play. Um, so that's going on right now. Looks like uh, pretty exciting stuff. I think on the top tables, or at least on the key camera feature matches that we've seen, there's been a lot of sneak and show. Um, that could be because William uh, Huey Jensen is uh, undefeated after day one, and he's piloting that deck, of course. Yeah, there's a couple big names uh, piloting that deck, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more information about this uh, <coughs> once the tournament has ended. I mean, but that's one that's one we've seen a lot of. I mean, I have an opinion about that. I mean, the thing is, though, Sneak and Show is one of those decks that is relatively linear and easy easier to play if you're a person who hasn't played Legacy before or not very much. So playing a grindy mid-range deck in a format is probably not the best idea in a long tournament, as we've talked about this before, long control decks. Whereas playing something that's very linear of, I need show and tell, I need sneak attack, I need fatty, seems okay. Especially if you're unfamiliar with what's going on, because you don't care what your opponent is doing, essentially. Yeah, and I, mean, I don't think familiarity is as big a deal as the fact that you have to play eight rounds with that deck and eight other rounds. Yeah, and I like think that's the, the, that's the, the real that challenge. Play quickly. That's the real challenge with the Invitational is that you can be a legacy ringer. I mean, you could be like Matt or myself who really love, eat, breathe, and sleep the format. And then round five starts and you're playing standard. You don't know what the fuck is going on. I think there's an interesting mix of players at the Invitational. The people who are really good at standard, people who are really good at legacy, and the people who are like... Really good at magic. Yeah, just exactly. In general. Either really good at both or like Matt at both. Yeah. So, but uh, in terms of a sneak attack deck, I think it's really it's really an interesting deck from the standpoint that it has a really compact combo, a lot of redundant pieces, and it gets to play Force of Will, which means you can basically ignore what your opponent's doing unless they're going to about to kill you, then use your counter magic, while at the same time trying to race them with sneak attack and show and tell with Grizzlebrand and Emrakul, a tag team duo. On to talking about Commander? Yeah, it's a deck. It's a format. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a format, uh, obviously, with the uh, 
the new set coming out for Commander, there's uh, been a lot of talk. There's actually only, I think, 25 new cards. Um, no, that's not. And there's, there's 51 new cards, but about 51, half of them okay. just suck. Okay, I was going to so, say, like, none of them are playable except... So the big one that everyone's very chicken littling about is, uh, and I'm inclined to agree with them, this card seems really solid, is called, uh, well, actually, there's more than one. But uh, Identity Nemesis, which is one blue-blue, a merfolk rogue. It's a 3-1. As it enters the battlefield, choose a player. Identity Nemesis has protection from that player. Now, this is a little uh, odd, because what does protection from a player mean? Does that mean the player... Well, it has him? reminders text. It has reminder text. This creature cannot be blocked, targeted, damaged, or enchanted by a source controlled by that player. So... Wait, so if I'm understanding this correctly, it's pretty much hexproof. It's hexproof and unblockable. So think of Whoa. it like this. If protection from everything, like progenitus ability, was shroud, this is hexproof. Oh, very nice. Oh, we can just call him uh, Brogenitus or something like that. What's up, bro? Totally uh And he's totally in the picture, he's, 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 gig he's a gigantic merfolk. That's cutting a giant rock with, like, a sword of some sort. Which is what a lot of the talk has been about this guy, is that he will be an excellent thing to stick a sword onto. And that's what I don't like about it, to be honest. Like, yeah, I... but it's only a 3-1, and it's blue. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's never a 3-1. Uh, it's the 3-1 yeah, when you first cast them. <laughs> it's a 3-1 the, for the first turn only. It's a 4-2 when it comes into play, because on turn 2 you played Lord of Atlantis. Mm. Yeah, that too, if you're playing it in Merfolk. That's the thing that I think is really interesting, is this is seeing discussion in more... It's a Merfolk that's seeing discussion in more than just the Merfolk deck. It'd be interesting to see what kind of aggro decks or mid-range decks are able to race this guy. Because, if I understand correctly, he can block indefinitely um, without fear of dying, at least from most, dis most effects. Um... But if he's doing that, he's not really attacking. So it's more like, it's a really good defensive card, and it's a really good offensive card. He has essentially the best kind of invasion, yeah, evasion, which is every single type. Oh, he's going to be doing some invading, all right. Uh, one thing I think is really interesting, and we'll be getting into uh, the big tournaments coming up shortly, is that uh, the price on this card has been insane, just because, not because he's going to be very valuable, because the commander sets are not a limited print run, but because they're going to come out, and then immediately we have these big tournaments that people want to play them in. And uh, uh, the last one I saw, there are people paying over $50 for these, and he's going to be in a box that retails for 30 at Walmart. Whew, and sounds I've like heard, a MTG Finance hashtag. And I've heard, I just want you guys to correct me if I'm wrong, that Walmart has a few stores across the uh, world. A couple. Is, is this sold on, uh, at Walmart? This is one of the sets that will be at Walmart and Target, in addition to your local gaming store. But I would imagine most gaming stores are going to be selling out of them fairly quickly, or selling them over MSRP, or both. I guess I need to hit up some Walmarts out in rural areas, then. Well, and like I said, it's not a limited print run, so unless you want to play this in uh, Eternal Weekend or GPDC, I don't think it's really a concern in terms of being able to get a hold of it. Well, I think for me it might make a uh, significant effort to try to find a couple. Um, especially, the set becomes legal November 1st. Oh, hey, that's the first day of Eternal Weekend. It's also Star City LA. Hmm, which is just in my backyard. I think I might have to uh, spend a little money next Go to week. Walmart. Yeah. Well, I try to avoid going to Walmart, but for this I'll make an exception. Exactly. <laughs> Just push all the people with scooters out of the way and then get to the commander uh, decks. <laughs> well, I'm always worried about the people who are in their underwear. On their head. Uh, I have some more thoughts about this card, but we'll get into them when we do our tournament preview. Uh, another one I've seen a lot of talk about is Widespread Panic. Which is also the name of a pretty good band. But, MGG uh, card name bands. Uh, it's... Two and a red enchantment. Whenever a speller ability causes a controller to shuffle his or her library, that player puts a card from his or her hand on top of his or her library. Uh, wait, each player or each opponent? It says uh, it's controller, so that's everyone. Okay, so it is a symmetrical this affects everyone. effect. So this kind of reminds me of like um, 
Like when you shuffle fugue. We'll call it shuffle fugue card. Yeah, I'm I'm not really sure what this would see play in though. I have no fucking idea why people are up in arms over this card. So you shuffle your library, you put a card from your hand on top of your library. Big fucking deal. Yes. I mean, that's like a time walk, right? Yeah. So you make them skip their draw. You, you make their, their like, math. Like, I guess in decks that shuffle a lot, like that have tutors and fetches, uh, it could be <coughs> useful Maverick. as a sideboard card against them. But even then, I don't know how uh, how relevant that's going to be. I guess maybe it's a red answer for a storm deck because they play a bunch of fetches and tutors, and being able to uh, take a card out of their hand each time they want to shuffle is a pretty big deal against them. I'm not really sure what else it would be good against, though. Hmm, I could... I could see it being pretty good with Soldier of Fortune. I was just going to say Soldier of Fortune. Oh, yeah. Oh. My... Is Are you going to build Mono Red Soldier of Fortune Widespread Panic? Um, maybe. maybe to troll, like, a, a local event. but We could call it Widespread Fortune. <laughs> and then you could play Final uh... Fortune. No? Uh, yeah, I think we're pulling this a little too far. <laughs> Do y'all have any other cards you're interested in out of Commander? Um, Those are the ones I've seen the most I discussion think, about. Uh, there is one card that really uh, jumped out at me. I guess, I mean, to everyone. There's only like four playable cards in this entire set. Um, but one of the cards that I saw that was actually really novel uh, in terms of legacy playables is Toxic Deluge. I was just looking at that. Yeah, this one's a uh, black sorcery, two colorless and a black. Uh, when you play this spell, you may pay any amount of life. All creatures get minus X, minus X, where X is the amount of life you paid. Hey, you can use this to kill Identity uh, Thief or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things about this card are its mana costs in terms of legacy playable. Um, three mana is pretty much the threshold of when you need to start interacting um, with a lot of decks. And when you compare it, for instance, with Damnation, which costs four... You know, turn four might be a little too slow, let's say, against uh, a quick goy for um, other really fast, aggressive decks. Maybe, like, Death and Tax is putting on the clamps, or Maverick is starting to get a little out of hand, or possibly even Gaddock Teague's in play. So, the three mana cost is, is a huge, huge deal. This seems very much uh, like a, almost like a in, f in favor, f in flavor for Black uh, Bonfire of the Damned in terms of what it's going to be doing. It, which is, for the most part, wiping the board. Yeah. I think uh, the biggest application we'll see this card is in a storm, like a Burning Wish Storm um, deck. Yeah, to bounce, to kill multiple hate bears. Exactly. Um, where the two or three life payment is not that big of a deal. I mean, it's comparable to, like, Grim Tutor, for instance. But the ability to play through a Gaddock Teague is the most important one. Oh, can you, ima can you imagine? Hold on, hold on. Just think of it. Think of how delicious this is. Aetherstorm Cannonist, Gaddock Teague, Thalia. One turn, Burning Wish, Toxic Deluge. Next turn, you get to Toxic Deluge out three Hate Bears at the same time, which is like the worst thing in the world. Well, I do agree that you can do that, but you could already do that with uh, Virtue's Ruin. A portal uncommon, sure, destroy but all sure, white but creatures. nobody was playing Virtue's Ruin. I was. Okay, we're not everyone. Okay. Well, I mean, we're here to give our listeners some advice. Yeah, yeah, of course. In good tales, and sometimes Sam adds a little comment here and there, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other card I saw that I thought was interesting, just because of this line of play, I don't know if it will be playable in anything else, is Restore. It's one in a green sorcery, put target land card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And the reason that this card has a really funny line of play is you go... Uh, Turn one, what's the uh, the the cat that has life uh, step or has landfall? Yeah, turn one, step links. Turn two, fetch, play restore, play fetch again, and fetch again, and swing with your gigantic step links. I actually, I actually think I have. Yeah, that's eight damage on turn two. I think I can one up you, sir. Okay, you're playing against forty three lands, right? And they. I always factor that into my strategic uh, advice. As you should. And you use this to go get their tabernacle that you wasted? Exactly. Tabernacle or your own maze of Ith for their one of creeping tarpet wind condition. Or, or even better, they've milled the dark depths. You take their dark depths so they can't uh, thespian stage you. 
Oh, but then they can just copy your land anyway. Never mind. So then you take their Thespian stage. Ha! Huh. Yes! And then they just slow uh. grind off the counters. Yeah, don't they also play Wasteland and Life from Volume so they can get it all back afterwards? And we're banking on the fact that you have a clock. Oh, okay. We're banking on the fact that you are A, playing this card, and B, playing against 43 lands, <laughs> which I think I mean, that setup is pretty unlikely. Yeah, that intersection of possibilities is uh, pretty slim. And I think there is one more card. I think we covered pretty much every color except white. Uh, I think Matt may have already seen this card. It's the bouncy thingy with the stuff. I think it's called, like, Unexpectedly Absent. Unexpectedly still doesn't bounce Gattactique is what I've been calling it. Uh, well, I, I think it's actually really neat as a card. Um, effectively, it's a white instant answer. Let's uh, okay, actually, let's backtrack a little bit. Here's what the card does. It's X white white. Put um, target permanent non land permanent, permanent um, X cards from the top of the deck. So essentially, you're tucking it under your opponent, under your controller's top of the library. Um, now, there's no mention that X cannot be zero. So, if X is indeed zero, you essentially just um, submerge a non-land permanent. And it's instant speed, which is very important. Which means that you can do it for white-white in response to a fetch. Now, a lot right. of people that I know were thinking that this card was, you had to pay the mana cost. Like, oh, if I wanted that as a four permanent, you pay four white And they were just, like, dismissing the card completely. The card's awful. However, reading the card, you can bounce anything that troubles you as the Miracles player or whatever deck might be playing this. So, like, Sam, since you're a Miracles player, what's a what's a permanent that you would want to bounce before you can start doing your thing? Like a Pernicious Deed or something that's already on board? A, a Deed would be great, um, and EE would be solid. Um, if, if I'm playing this main board, just uh, on that assumption, honestly, it hits a lot of... Uh, it hits a lot of creatures that uh, might be ticking me down while I'm trying to find my win condition. I could actually see it very playable against Miracles, for instance. Tucking a Jace for two mana instant speed, that seems very good. Even a Counterbalance, yeah. um, at just the right strategic time. Um, also, imagine like uh, a Miracle player is about to go Miracle on you. They tap their top. In response, you can tuck one of their permanents maybe the top itself, and it'll essentially counter the Miracle, because they won't be drawing the Miracle. Ah, that's interesting. Very good call. Yeah, you, so you're saying you put their random card on top instead of Terminus or Entry. Right, so let's say they go activate top. That ability just is on the stack. The top is already... Now, you can't really do this while the top is still active, which means that you do really have to target the top. Otherwise, um, they could just pay one more mana and rearrange all the goodies. So, all right. those are some cards we think that may see some legacy play. It may take a while for people to adopt them. Part of the reason is the availability of the set, especially at the onset. But uh, possibly around December we may start to see a little more action from these cards. Well, <clears throat> the uh, so our last topic today is uh, what to expect for the two big tournaments coming up next month. We've got uh, Eternal Weekend, the 1st through 3rd of November. And Grand Prix, Washington, D.C., the 15th through 17th of November. Uh, Kobe, why don't you get us started off? What do you expect to see out of these? So actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe actually maybe a couple of days ago, my weeks, my days seem, seem to seem like that. They seem kind of like that sentence? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's been a, a rough week or so. Um, someone did a metagame analysis using statistical correlation of date placement of decks in the DC area. I know it sounds a little uh, um, you know, Ivory Tower-ish, but uh, Somebody's using their undergrad degree and putting it to good use. Yes, that's right. Uh, I always appreciate seeing critical thinking, um, especially when it comes to magic strategy or ma magic analysis. So this uh, really gave me a statistical boner, so to speak. Um, but effectively, taking all the recent... Um, Star City results from the last year in the DC area, maybe expanding it to like a four-hour drive radius, um, and seeing what has what have be people been playing, what has been winning, what has been placing, and as a result of that, um, the statistical analysis actually showed some very interesting trends. Um, so obviously, you always ha you have your big name players like Sneak Show, Rug, um, Stoneblade decks, Maverick Miracles. Um, 
burn, combo, dredge, you know, all that good stuff, elves and whatnot. Um, and that's what we ex we would expect, like, any given Sunday at a Star City event, or even at a reasonably large Legacy tournament. But I think one of the things that really popped out from that analysis was there were two decks that were trending really heavily. Um, that is, they're both popular um, recently, and they've been doing better recently. And those two decks are Reanimator and Elves. I'm set. Counterbalance on one. <laughs> and uh, we'll provide a, a link to that analysis in the show notes. I think those, uh, really, those are decks that you should be prepared against in a tournament of this level regardless. Um, I, especially for, uh, uh, yeah, let me, I think I'm getting a little sidetracked. A Grand Prix is a 15 round event, so you could be potentially playing 15 different decks. Um, so you have to really be prepared for every single possibility out there. So basically, the point of this is you should never leave home without grave hate. People are only playing Reanimator because nobody's playing any sort of real grave hate. Everybody, as we have said before, still thinks that Deathrite Shaman is a real answer. And it's not. You know what's a real answer? Nihil Spellbomb. You know what's a real answer? Scavenging Ooze, if you need to. Oh, yeah. Rest in peace. I remember Scavenging Ooze all the way back in Grand Prix Indianapolis back in March of 2012. It was Great. a huge, huge addition to the Maverick deck that I played at the time and uh, directly correlated to my success in that tournament. And it's just, I mean, Rest in Peace, too, same thing. A lot of people have gone away from playing Rest in Peace because, you know, it just shuts off their Death Rush Helmet and Goyf. No, you realize it just kills all the unfair decks. Come on. Start packing some hate, boys and ladies. So uh, one thing I think is really interesting, we're talking about the GP, but both of these tournaments are around the same time. Uh, one thing that will be interesting for the Grand Prix is that you've got Eternal Weekend on the 1st through 3rd. That weekend, you also have Bazaar of Mox in Paris, which means that two weeks before the Legacy Grand Prix, you will have well over a 1,000 people worth of results out of just two tournaments. Um, and what will be interesting to see out of that is uh, whether the metagame does a very quick reaction um, and maybe that's something you can kind of next level and take advantage of. So if there's a deck that really uh, explodes out of either of these big tournaments, the metagame may overcorrect for those decks, and you may be able to exploit that overcorrection. As an example, if both of those uh, big tournaments had a lot of reanimator decks, you'd expect to see a lot of graveyard hate coming in Washington, so don't play a graveyard deck in Washington, as an example. I pretty much agree entirely with your analysis, Sam. <laughs> Always play Graveyard Hate. But, well, that's that's just one example, but I think uh, that will make the GP a little more interesting, having those two big tournaments to lead up and kind of set the stage in terms of what people are going to be expecting to see. Yeah. I also, one, one other deck that I do expect to see um, perform reasonably well, so um, actually this is more of a complex analysis that I kind of did by conjecture, um, an experience is uh, in a large event like a Grand Prix or uh, Eternal Weekend perhaps people may want to play but not necessarily have all the cards so you'll see a, potentially a lot of budget variations or budget decks um, just to kind of participate so that's usually when you'll see a lot of uh, mono red decks um, trying to burn you out, play the fundamental turn four um, you know, just try to goldfish you and keep you honest uh, also Affinity, because it's very easy to port from a modern version to a legacy version, and effectively you only gain doing that transition. Um, so these two decks kind of help uh, keep the dirtily, slow, kind of like, you know, super Timmy decks um, under control by just putting a huge pressure on them, a uh, huge clock on them. Um, so as a result, especially against Burn and its price of progress, I expect to see a lot more basic heavy decks Oh, and um, the Blood Moons we were talking about for, you know, every episode since we started. Right, so um, playing a deck like maybe Merfolk or Death and Taxes or Goblins, um, you'll s I, I would expect to do reasonably well. Pretty much all the mana resource denial Aether Vile decks, um, which both, well, I mean, all three of those decks uh, fall into that category. Um, not only can they um, have really, really good game against uh, Canadian Threshold, because they have a lot of basics, they have Aether Vile, which is also a big headache for Rug. 
but they can also ignore the press progress from Burn. I also think that uh, Patriot is going to be the uh, blue-white-red Patriot Delver deck is going to be a very good choice. Why? I think the deck is a little bit better than, than Rug for a few reasons. One, you still get to play the tempo game. You still get to play Delver. You still get to play Bolts. You still get to play whatever. Two, you get to play Swords of Plowshares. The main problem that Rug seems to have is if you also put out a Goy for a big knight or whatever, it's very hard for them to deal with it. They need to submerge it. Whereas here, they can just Swords to Plowshares. However, I think the addition of Swords to Plowshares is probably a little bit dicey. Just because of the fact of, A, you're a, you're kind of a burn deck, you're trying to race them, and then you're playing Swords of Plowshares, maybe switching to Path, especially in a format where nobody's playing Basics, might be a better idea, much like a Zoo list. That's debatable, obviously, but continue. Grim Lava Mancer, choose up Deathrite Shamans, um, and you get to play the long game with Stoneforge Mystic. So you can play out the early game of, like, Delver, Bolt, this and that, Stifle you, and then, oh, you've kind of, you've, my opponent has kind of started to stabilize from my Delver attacks. Oh, drop Stoneforge Mystic for Batter Skull. Hope they have removal now. And I think having that long game or that or that very or that much easier shift to a more mid range or control role is is what makes Patriot a little bit better. And you have access to rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace is big. We've been saying it. Graveyard heat. So I'd say watch out for All Patriot. Right, so I have a final question for uh, each of y'all about uh, these these two big tournaments. Um, first one, which one will get more attendance for Legacy, Eternal Weekend or the Grand Prix? Matt, go ahead first. Okay. Um, wishful thinking, I would love to say America, but you, we know that's not going to happen. I really think that uh, Bazaar of Mux in Paris is probably going to have about 1,000 people. Um, last time, I think, when they had it in Annecy the usual place that they have it, in May. Uh, you were there, Kobe, but it had, what, 700 people or something? Yeah, which is still huge for a non-Grand Prix eternal event. Oh, obviously. And then now, instead of having it in some random, you know, border town with Switzerland, they're having it in Paris, like, very easy to fly into. Uh, it's a town that people want to go to. You can bring your significant other, and you can... And it's also, too, it's on Valentine's Day weekend or something like that? Oh, no, this oh, one's okay. the first one. No, 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 this, is, this, is this upcoming weekend, six yes, days from now. never mind. So it doesn't matter because Paris is great for bringing other people anyway. So if you have non-magic people that you're going on this trip with, you can say, hey, you know, go do something else. I'm going to go play some magic, and then we'll go hang out in Paris. Like, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Whereas... Take a to the Louvre. I'm going to go play some cards. Exactly. Whereas I think, don't get me wrong, Eternal Weekend has been something that I'm sure a lot of people in the northeast of the states, or at least the east coast of the states, have been have been thinking about for however many months it's been announced. It looks like a great event. I just don't think that the attendance is there. Yeah, I, I do tend to agree. Um, I think that we may be lucky to get maybe 800 people at the Eternal Weekend. But uh, much more than that is a bit of a stretch. Um, part of the reason is there is no cash purse, similar to a Grand Prix, which draws out a lot of people out to these types of events. Uh, well, the Grand Prix events, anyway. Um, <coughs> and I think um, the proximity and date to the actual Grand Prix um, also precludes anyone who may be going to that event instead. So, for instance, I'm sitting here on the West Coast, I pretty much have to pick which of the two I'll be able to go to. Um, I can't make the trip out twice, considering they're two weeks apart. I'd be more inclined to go to the Grand Prix, for instance. So you think the Grand Prix will be bigger than Eternal Weekend? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll you'll actually the Grand Prix is a good um, is a good tournament for pros and semi pros to go to because of the pro points and the cash burst. Whereas Eternal Weekend is really just more of a community event. Um, I mean, it really is the community event. We host our essentially championship tournament, and I think really we're trying to model it after Bizarre Moxon, but that's an aside. Um, so we have both Legacy and Vintage Champs. But, Sam, you, you hit it right on the head. I mean, this upcoming weekend is going to be huge for Eternal Magic. You have two large marquee Legacy events, followed by two large marquee Vintage events. Um, so we're going to see a ton of results. I think the results from this weekend alone are going to set the tone for Legacy and especially Vintage for the next six months. Well put. Alright, anything else for uh, 
for this cast? I did actually uh, allude to it earlier in Matt's uh, tournament report. That's right, you acquired some new lands. Yeah, I am now a, uh, a bigger landowner in Legacy. Uh, I, the joke kind of falls apart once you actually have to <laughs> say it out loud. Um, I actually have a better way to say it, if, if you would let me. Yeah, go, go ahead. So, as some of you may know, Jacob recently acquired some new pimp, some alpha power. And he was like, how do I display this alpha power? I need a mantelpiece for this. So you did. You went out and you bought a mantelpiece with a house around it. Uh, yeah, I, I came across uh, one of my good buddies, Adam. Um, he has a pretty sweet collection. I actually picked up my Korean wastelands um, from him about two years ago in a good trade. And then he was uh, trying to downsize his collection of beta dual lands. Oh, I was talking yeah. about your house. Oh, well, no, I'm talking yeah. about legacy mana bases here. Oh, fuck, sorry. We might want to yeah, get the that, house out then. Cause <laughs> that, that Cody's joke, like, I got important stuff to talk about. Yeah, the house is just like, you know, it's more like having uh, Paradox Haze in play. I got two upkeep steps with that thing. <laughs> oh, I was just talking about how you needed a place to display your new pimp. So you're like, mantelpiece? House. Yeah, unfortunately the place doesn't have a fireplace, so... We're gonna have to. I'm just gonna have to get a safe and you know put it in there with like a webcam, make sure it's always there. Like log in from uh, you know from an event, be like, oh, whew, it's still there. You should just post a link to that webcam on the pimp thread. Look, I don't have the mo- amount of money to support that kind of bandwidth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like view a, view a lotus dot com. Oh, shit, <laughs> I, I better go register that right now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I picked up a couple of uh, sweet legacy pieces, and um, so I picked up my second beta dual land. Uh, bayou. Second beta bayou, that's right. Um, which pretty sweetly goes into a dark maverick deck. So uh, now, with, um, with those beta savannas that I picked up about a year and a half ago, and with the beta bayous, maverick is a thing. I'm going to be rocking Maverick in Star City LA next weekend. So, it's going to be an interesting experiment. I hope the combo matchup is in my favor with uh, the Thalias. I hope the Jun matchup is in my favor with Sigarda, host of Heron. Oh, Sigarda. Yeah. And we're talking about how um, Loxodon Smiter is really good against Liana. Sigarda is even better. She can't even make you sacrifice your dudes. The problem is the only the only time that I could see her being quite awful is when you can't cast her and they just Liliana her out of your hand. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. But to counteract that, I am playing two Horizon Canopy, which I feel is an important um, component missing from most Maverick decks. An important thirty-five dollar component missing from. Right. Well, I mean, I haven't bought cards like that in a while. Sure. Because because uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it is unfortunate that it is spiked so heavily from um, the World Championships. I think uh, Reduke was piloting a green-white hex-proof bant, whatever deck. So that card spiked up naturally. Um, but um, this deck also s- features two Sylvan Libraries, which Matt talked about in a few episodes ago as being very, very important mid-range cards against um, Control. So. Looking to take that, pilot it, um, hopefully catch some good matchups and type play and maybe a little camera time and show off the new goodies. If you get camera time, though, you have to somehow work in Everyday Eternal. Somehow. Um, yeah, we, we really need, like, sleeves or something. Yeah. Or yeah, I think we man. need to get on that. You heard it here first. Uh, your source. Somebody make us a logo. <laughs> Um, actually, one of my f- one of my friends will help us out. He's uh, he's a graphic designer, um, but yeah, they, they, you got to get it done. So, looking forward to playing Maverick again, picking it up. Um, I think uh, Ruben Bressler, part of the coverage team for Star City, made a uh, running bet with Glenn Jones about um, whether Maverick will make six top eights in two in 2013. And I think he made it at a time when Maverick was kind of like at a historic low thanks to Terminus, the card, uh, which completely wrecks Maverick's game plan of throwing a bunch of roadblocks onto the board. Um, and so... Uh, Are there the five guy, so far? I think there's like four. I think we'll have to double check and, uh, and report on it later. So but, uh, double register yourself in the tournament, make top eight, and then we have Twice. Six. That's right. 
Playing the part of Kobe is Jacob, and playing the part of Jacob is Kobe. Exactly. Um, so I want to do my part, and I, I really enjoy playing the Maverick deck as a fair deck. Um, and I do love me some Grizzlebrand, and Sam and I went over that in the last episode. But uh, I don't think right now is a good time for that with uh, all the graveyard hate people should be playing in their decks or, gra or sideboards. Um, I mean, it's Tin Fins, for instance, is... is extremely fun to play, but it's really volatile when it comes to fighting hate and also fighting Threshold, which seems to be everywhere these days. Fuck that card. Fuck Delver of Secrets. Really, really hate that card. Yep, that's why we have that picture of you and Delver and then the, the heart. Yeah, we're BFFs forever and ever. We'll have to uh, tweet that again so that people can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, make sure uh, I... make sure we have it in the show notes as well. <laughs> um... I think Sam is referencing to uh, a, tw a couple of tweets I made 18 months ago about how much I hated Delver. So I showed uh, a couple of pictures of, you know, a Delver unflipped, and then a Delver flipped ripped into four pieces because I hated so much with the hashtag F you! Or Wrong. something like that. Yep. Oh, right. oh so memes. Think we're good for, uh, for this week? Yeah, I think so. Well, thanks for listening, folks. We'll be trying to get another episode in between these big tournaments this weekend and the GP, but we may not be able to squeeze it in. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Email us at everydayeternalcast at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash everydayeternalpodcast. Or follow us on Twitter at eternalmtg. Thanks for listening.